before you act, before you act on anything. If I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who does it, but it is sin living in me that does it. But obedience is what brings us into a deeper relationship with God. You know, you can serve in church. You can even wear a collar like I'm wearing and be a pastor like I am, but you have zero relationship with the Lord. And so obedience is the beginning point of everything. That from today, you will covenant with the God of Israel, choose to obey him and disconnect the generations from you moving forward from any connections of evil in the past and introduce an overflow of a thousand generational blessings upon you, your seed and the seeds of your seed that will come after you. Amen. Today, we look at the topic of blessings of obedience. Blessings of obedience. Now, the word obedience, the word obedience means compliance with an order, to comply with an order. It means submission to an authority, but it also means uh, to behave in accordance to certain rules that are set. Um, it also means to pay close attention to somebody who is in authority. It is, means to follow wholeheartedly like Caleb did in Joshua chapter 14, uh, verse 8, uh, where Caleb followed the Lord God wholeheartedly. It is to give oneself fully to a particular cause. So obedience, therefore, is to be in good terms with God, to be in good books with the God of Israel. But that obedience also really is the lifeline for a deeper connection and a deeper relationship with God because obedience sets you apart from everything else that the Lord hates. So it is a lifeline. One, it creates a relationship and a friendship between you and God because you choose to be on his side. You choose to be opposite what he hates and therefore it gives you a a ground to thrive, a lifeline to prosper, a lifeline to be better and different because you are on the side of God. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22, the Bible says, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. Meaning that the Lord delights more, not in our religiosity, not in the fact that you came to church on a Sunday. It's good to come to church on a Sunday. Not because you tithed. It's good to tithe and it's biblical to tithe. Not because you serve in church. It's very good to serve in church. But those things, those are the things that we do which necessarily do not qualify for our relationships with the Lord. But obedience is what brings us into a deeper relationship with God. You know, you can serve in church. You can even wear a collar like I'm wearing and be a pastor like I am, but you have zero relationship with the Lord. And so obedience is the beginning point of everything. It sets the foundation that builds a solid, fruitful, lifelong and a thriving relationship between you and God. Samuel rebukes Saul and tells Saul, the Lord is more pleased when you obey. And so beloved, as we gather here today, I stand to remind you that the greatest thing the Lord requires of you as a believer is to obey that obedience then. Now when you serve, when you give, when you do all those other religious things that we do, then they have value, then they have an impact. Proverbs chapter 4 verse 20 says, my son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. For they are life to those who find them. That obedience connects us with God's word and that God's word when it dwells in our hearts, it indeed is life. So it brings us 
into a living relationship with God. And this reminds me of what Jesus tells his disciples in John chapter 14, verse 23. He tells them, if you obey my teachings or commands, then my father will love you. Then my father and I will come and make a home with you. John chapter 14, verse 23. That if you love the Lord, we will obey him. And if you obey him, he, the Father and Jesus will come and make a home with us. There is a deeper meaning there. And I just want to explain. The deeper meaning there is, if, if, if you're a friend of God, I mean, if you obey the Lord, if you do what the Lord says, if you pay attention to what the Lord says, if you incline your heart to undertaking the precepts of the Lord, the Bible says, then the Lord will love you. That the Lord will love you. I don't know whether you feel how deep that is. That Jesus will love you because you choose to walk in his ways. And he's saying, once he loves you, then he, him and the Father will come and make a home with you. Uh, that simply means that God will come to be your friend. Um, he will come now to establish himself around you. We are going to talk about that in a little while, about God's presence. But beloved, if you want to attract God to you, obey him. Just simply do what he tells you. Be in opposition to what the devil tells you. Do what the Lord tells you. And you'll be attracting him in the space around you. And later we'll be seeing what happens when God is your friend, when God establishes a home with you. I just want you to begin to imagine. Remember, when, when he visits, when he visits um, Moses, what happens to Moses? Complete change and abundant blessings. In Exodus chapter uh, 33, you see that verse 12, 13, 14, 15. When, when, when Joshua invites him, in the tent of meeting there in the wilderness, when Joshua obeys, that obedience and trusts the Lord, what happens? The pillar of cloud comes over the tent of meeting, God affirming that I have come to be with you. At night, he comes in a pillar of cloud and hangs over the camp where the Israelites are encamped. A signature, a confirmation, a tick, that I have come to dwell with you. Friends, when you obey God, it's so simple. The Lord comes. He comes himself. He does not send an emissary. He doesn't send angels. He comes himself and establishes himself around you. And so that is what obedience does. Now in Haggai, we see that at first, these people disobey. They disobey so badly. And we will be discussing about disobedience next Sunday. But once they disobey, the prophet rises and rebukes them then the children of Israel commit to obedience. In Haggai chapter 12, uh, chapter 1, verse 12 to 15, now we see the consequences of obedience because they obey and then they take a complete U-turn and obedience here in the story in Haggai simply means that they choose now to do what God wants. They make an about turn and they choose to do what God wants. We see three things in Haggai chapter 1, verse 12 to 15. The first thing we see, when they commit to obey the Lord, the fear of the Lord grew in them. Verse 12. The fear of the Lord captured their hearts. It means when you obey God, I mean, you, you develop an attitude towards God that you don't just sin carelessly. Um, he dominates your heart and you tremble at the thought of sinning. You, you, you cannot stand uh, sin being propagated around you. The fear of the Lord. Do you know, have you ever felt as a believer those moments when you want to do something that outrightly is not right and you know it, but you just feel like a shock, like a rush of fear descending on you? And that is what happens when you live in obedience. Meaning, the Lord puts parameters around you to help you not to stray away from him. But the second thing we see here is that the Lord reassures them of his presence. He tells them that I will be with you. When we obey the Lord then, it means, as I said earlier, the Lord comes and comes with us. 
Beloved, in my life, in my walk as a believer, the greatest thing I desire is the Lord always to be with me. Because I know when the Lord is with me, there is nothing that will be impossible with me when the God of Israel, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is on my side. There is nothing that will be impossible with me. And so the Lord reassures them of his presence. But the third thing we see in Haggai um, is that their hearts are stirred to heed God's command. It means they are excited now to be doing what the Lord wants. When you choose to obey, tunakuta kwamba kuna utamu katika hali ya kumtii na kumfuata Mwenyezi Mungu. We are not being pushed. If you are a teenager or a young person, you don't have to be reminded that you need to do this. No. If you are a husband or a wife, you don't have to be reminded because inside you is engraved the desire to obey the Lord. And so obedience sets God's people apart as a special category of people, as a remnant, as a grouping that Peter later calls a holy nation. A holy nation. Which also God calls Israel in Exodus a holy nation. You become special, he said to your part. Again, you will see those in Deuteronomy as I get to expose some of the blessings. And so, it is so incredible that God invites us into a relationship with him. But Deuteronomy chapter 28 that um, was read to us spells out a long list of blessings that will follow people who will commit to obeying the Lord. Uh, if you now open your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 28, I want us to go through it systematically and just lift out some of those blessings that the Lord confirms. So I've grouped some of them. So the first promised blessing, the first promised blessing is that God promises to bless us regardless of our geographical location. He says in verse 3 of Deuteronomy chapter 28 that you will be blessed in the city and in the countryside, uh, in the towns and in the villages. In verse 6, he says, you will be blessed when you come in and when you go out. In verse 8, the second part of it, he says, the Lord will bless you in the land he's going to give you. Remember, that is a promise he also gives Joshua later in Joshua chapter 1. And so what we see here is that when we obey the Lord, when we do what God wants, then God releases his blessings upon us regardless of where we are, regardless of your physical or geographical location. Even if you're in the village, the Lord will prosper you there. Even when you're in the city, the Lord will prosper you there. Even when you live in Kayole, the Lord will prosper you there. Even when you live in Madare, his blessings are not indifferent to Madare. Even when you live in Kilimani or in Runda or in Upper Hill, wherever you are, it's because the distinction here is not where you are. The distinction is that you are in collab with God. So you are inside God. John chapter 7, 15 verse 7 says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done to you. The Lord does not say you need to travel and be in Frankfurt. The Lord does not say you need to be in Auckland in New Zealand for you to be blessed. He does not say you need to migrate to the city to be blessed. Whereas the city provides more opportunities, his blessings upon you as an individual are based on his character as God, not on geographical location. And therefore, as Evans, I want to hang on God and I want to connect with him that his character may release the abundance of blessings upon me, not because of where I am. Not because the name I carry. Not because of my lineage and ancestral history. No, because of me dwelling in him. And so, beloved, one message that the Lord pumps into our hearts this morning is to dwell in him. John says, remain in me. When you remain in me, then everything will be yours. The second thing that the Lord says, he promises, the second blessing he promises is that the seed of your womb will be blessed. 
that the seed of your womb will be blessed. In verse 4, uh, verse 4, part 1 of it, and then verse 11, the second part of it, he repeats that. Uh, he repeats that. It means, if you obey the Lord, then he will bless you with children. And once he blesses you with children, he will bless those children and the generations after. Reverend Malima, when I was coming in today, I observed something very interesting. I don't know maybe because this message was in my heart, but as I was walking in, I was, I, was, I was seeing quite a number of ladies who were pregnant. And as I came in, when I looked this way, when I looked this way, I'm seeing quite a bit of bumps around. And I was like, okay, there is something that is happening here. There is something that is happening here. And you can see the bumps around you. I mean, those are the blessings of God. The Lord promises that when you obey him, he will bless you with children. And when he blesses you with children, he will also bless those children. Not just give you children, abandon them. When you walk with the Lord correctly, beloved, the Lord will bless those children. You know, a disclaimer, sometimes you hear the Lord will, might have chosen in his infinite wisdom not to give you children. When he does that, you are still blessed in many other ways. Sometimes he even brings children around you. Even if you didn't have yours that you said yourself, he brings a company of children around you. And so the blessings of God are not dependent on what we want, but on his infinite uh, wisdom as God. But when I, see, when I see people pregnant, I see God working miracles in them. Because none of us is capable in biology of manufacturing children. But it's the blessing of God. And when he blesses you with children, Exodus chapter 20, verse 4, one of our Ten Commandments says, uh, verse 4 to 6, you shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven or above the, uh, heaven above or on earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of their parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Exodus 20 verse 4 to 6. That for a thousand generations who love the Lord, he shows his mercy and he allows his goodness to follow them. It simply means, beloved, that as you obey the Lord today, here and now, that you are laying a foundation of generational blessings upon you, upon the seed of your womb, and the other generations that will follow from you. That simply means we must be careful. Some of us are very careless the way we behave and the way we do things. And when you are careless like that, you're passing on those curses and you'll see them next Sunday. You're passing them on to other people. Today, some of you who are here, as I said a couple of Sundays ago, are enjoying the blessings that are, have accrued from the obedience of your grandparents. I remember my grandmother, Jerusa, who was a staunch believer in the Lord. Yet my grandfather was a witch doctor. But my grandmother went to the Lord, a serious to as a woman who got to know the Lord when the gospel came first here. She prayed for us. She committed to the Lord. She claimed us for God. Generations after my grandmother died in 1982, when I was a very small boy, today, I am a priest as a consequence of the covenant my grandmother made with the generations of our family that would come after her. Today, I'm reaping incredible and abundant grace and blessings that have accrued as a consequence of one woman from the shores of Lake Victoria who chose to obey the Lord. Without her, I would be past tense today. I would have died as a thug, HIV and AIDS would have killed me like it killed my contemporaries in class eight and in secondary school. But the Lord has preserved me and the Lord has set me apart to enjoy the blessings that he promised because of obedience of one woman. And so today here, there are some of you whose families have been struggling and you could be the breaker of the curses. You could be the introducer of blessings. You could be the person who commands the U-turn. I want to challenge you, beloved, to begin from today. 
if your family worshipped other gods, if your family sacrificed things to other gods, that from today you will covenant with the God of Israel, choose to obey him and disconnect the generations from you moving forward from any connections of evil in the past and introduce an overflow of a thousand generational blessings upon you, your seed and the seeds of your seed that will come after you. Amen? Amen? And if you don't have a child and you're trusting the Lord for one, by the way, it's always good to hang around people who are pregnant because there's anointing around them. Ask the Lord to bless you, the seed of your womb. The third blessing we see here is your agricultural enterprise will be blessed. In verse 4b, he talks of your crops and your livestock will be blessed. In verse 5, he says, your baskets will be full. In verse 8, he says, your barns and your land will be blessed. And he concludes by saying, the works of your hand will be blessed. And these are repeated in verse 11 and also in verse 12, where he says, he will bless the works of your hands. Meaning, when you live in obedience... Even the vegetation around you bow to the command of the Lord. They heed to the blessing of the Lord. It's transmitted to them. When you plow your shamba, the Lord causes it to prosper. When it rains and other people's shambas are not doing well, the Lord blesses yours. Your livestock wanna chapa dabo dabo, wanna chapa triplets, because the blessings of the Lord is upon you. What you put your hands to do, whether it's in the business that you do, whether it's the savings that you put in the bank, the Lord affects the economy because of you. He affects your economy around you because his favor rests on you. As we said earlier, you are his friend. It does not matter what your neighbor does in their business or vile wame filisika because the Lord isolates you as his friend. So the Lord is more interested in you and therefore he will make you to prosper. When everyone else is not doing well, you will just get one tender. And that one tender will bring a hundredfold profit because the favor of the Lord is with you. You don't need to bribe to take a tender to a particular supplier. You simply need to ask the Lord, may your favor go with me. You promise in your word in Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 12 that you will bless the works of my hands. Ask the Lord, bless it now as I go. Open those doors. Fungua hizo milango. Ni ingi, ni one ni kipata tender bila kupeana rushwa. Ni ishara ya kwamba sisi ni marafiki wake menyezi mungu na mungu is very interested in us. Beloved, the Lord blesses everything around you when you live in obedience. I encourage you to watch a film called The Fiji, Revival in Fiji. When the Fijians returned to the Lord, even the rivers that were rotten and were drying up and were smelly, the rivers began to flow and the fish could just be carried from the rivers. When you walk with the Lord, the Lord blesses everything you put your hands to do. When people are crying that it is January, it's so difficult, you just see favor come around you. The Lord opens an imaginable and planned sources of income. And so the rivers of blessings flow through you. That, for me, is the God that I know. Because my wife taught me never to say, Nimesota. Uh, that's a bad confession. And so we see it even in this January. When struggles are there, we just see the abundance of the provision of God. Number four, very quickly as I move towards the end, it says in verse seven that the Lord will give you victory over your enemies. Meaning, he promises to fight your battles. The Lord promises to rain confusion over everyone who schemes around you when you choose to obey him. You know, sometimes we want to fight with people, but we, we struggle. Beloved, when you obey the Lord, the Lord exposes your enemies and he grants you victory. He did that to the children of Israel in Joshua. He did that to Moses. He did that to the prophets and everyone else as you see and the kings who are aligned to the Lord. And so when you're on the side of the Lord, the Lord fights for you. He contends for you. When the enemy visits your family with innuendos and things that are meant to bring you down, the Lord stands on your side to fight for you. I want to remind us that the greatest enemy we fight is the devil. 
In Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12, the Bible says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, against powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. Meaning, the enemy sets himself to fight us every corner, everywhere. But when we live in obedience to the Lord, the Lord takes over that fight. He fights it for us. Because you cannot fight demons yourselves. You know, sometimes even when you struggle with marital issues, those are demons. Those are demons of people who died not married. People who died in your lineage, separated. People who died who never lived with a wife or a husband. When they see you prosper and they see you do well, they jeer and they say, how dare them do well. And therefore, they stir up dissension from around you. They set up demons who come to bring separation around you. Beloved, that war you cannot fight on your own. I charge you to invite the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of Kings. The great warrior who can take head on the demons of separation and divorce. The spirit of adultery and fornication. This Jesus who reigns peace in families. That is the Jesus who is able to fix you. Because you cannot manage demons. You cannot manage principalities and powers. And, 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 and those forces from the dark world in your history. He alone is able. And I ask you, wouldn't you want to be on the Lord's side? Wouldn't you want to side with the Lord? Because he assures us of victory. Number five, the Lord will lead you. The Lord will lead you to lend to many and borrow from none. He says that in verse 12, uh, the third part of it, verse 12c. The Lord will cause you to lend to many and borrow from none. What happens when the Lord has blessed the works of your hands? That you become a donor. The Lord raises you as a donor. And you don't go borrowing here to repay this loan, then you borrow here to repay that other loan. Oh, uh, Shylocks and Fuliza, everything around you. Mbaka, you have 10 lines. Beloved, you need to begin to learn the blessing of obedience. When you live in obedience, the Lord does something in the economy around you. He activates the hidden treasures and releases them to flow through you. And so that is a promise that the Lord gives to those who live in him. I remember one time my wife and I, we were living in Gong. We had just started. Actually, she was not working. I was working alone, very small salary. But with that small salary, do you know, we, we survived. We were even shocked. Sometimes our friends would come to borrow from us. And then we remembered, by the way, do you know this is scripture? This is scripture that is being fulfilled. So it does not matter how much you have. The Lord helps you to be disciplined, to know how to manage your resources, to put this one here, and they grow, they multiply, and then you become somebody who is a blessing to other people. The last one is that the Lord promises that he will make you the head and not the tail. The head and not the tail. In verse 13, he says, you'll always be at the top and not at the bottom. He says, he will, in verse 1, he said, he will set you high above the nations of the earth. Do you know what that means? Do you know what that means as I get to conclusion? That means that the Lord reaffirms that you are his firstborn. You are the firstborn of the Lord. And he reaffirms that you are the sons and daughters of the Lord. In Jewish culture, the firstborn was entitled to a double share of the father's inheritance. It simply means the Lord makes you number one everywhere. When you walk in obedience, the God of Israel is with you. He puts his signature over you. He confirms to everyone that you are his. When you obey him in private, people will see the fruit in public. And when they see the fruit in public, they will glorify the Father whom you represent. And when they glorify the Father because of the fruits of obedience they see in you, then the Lord will bless you publicly. The Lord will not bless you just privately. Yes, he will bless you privately, but the Lord will bless you publicly in the seeing of everyone. He says he will set you high above the nations that people will see. People will know that iyo muluya, padri murefu muluya ule wa all saints, huyo mutu amebarikiwa kweli. Kwa sababu tunaona mungu wa kitenda majabu maishani mwake. That for me is the God that I know. That is the God that I believe in. That is the God that I've seen walk in me, fulfilling the promises that he gave me. As we get to pray, 
as we get to pray, I want us to ask ourselves, in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 15 and 16, the Bible says, I see, I set before you today life and prosperity on one hand. And on the other hand, I set before you death and destruction. So two things. Verse 16 says, For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commands and decrees and laws. Then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are inheriting to possess. Consider your ways. Examine where you are. Where are you? Are you at a point of total obedience to the Lord? Or you are at a wishy washy point. Obedience brings those three things. He, it makes you to be a friend of God. It lifts you to a privileged position. And it releases heavenly blessings upon you. Which side are you taking? Deuteronomy is asking, I put before you this and this. What are you choosing this morning? <laughs> Before you act on anything, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who does it, but it is sin living in me that does it. But obedience is what brings us into a deeper relationship with God. You know, you can serve in church. You can even wear a collar like I'm wearing and be a pastor like I am, but you have zero relationship with the Lord. And so obedience is the beginning point of everything. That from today, you will covenant with the God of Israel I'll choose to obey him and disconnect the generations from you moving forward from any connections of evil in the past and introduce an overflow of a thousand generational blessings upon you, your seed, and the seeds of your seed that will come after you. Amen. Amen. Amen.